Military veterans from different generations discuss their wartime experiences. The American citizen really doesn't understand the American soldier. In this society, vets are stigmatized. I hope nobody has to go through what I went through. In all the years since I served, I've had one person ask me what it was like there. We don't exist. We don't exist. Now, Generations on East Tennessee PBS. Operation Generations is a journalistic experiment with conversations between veterans of different wars, different ages. We went on SD and Papa Son was had this meat on rotation. We done ate K rations so long. I done had a little bit of everything. Dog, cat, muskrat. Uh, Cause Papa Son cooked everything. Now, if you seen a dog in Nam, something's wrong with it. <laughs> In 1967, Robert Mentor Jr. was drafted into the Army and worked as an infantry soldier during the Vietnam War. I, I really loved the military life in some ways. I just hated the, the murderous aspects of it, I guess. Mark Runge was a rotten child and a terrible student without a lot of options when he joined the Army in 1988. He served in the Persian Gulf War with a combat engineer unit. 1953, I quit school and lied about my age and joined the Navy. Charlie Stevens and his family were stationed in Japan when Charlie got deployed to Vietnam in 1968, near the end of his military career. He worked as a boat driver. I was from a military family. I was actually born on the Army's birthday. I joined halfway uh, through my, high, my senior year of high school in 1997 uh, and enlisted in Tennessee Army National Guard. Chad Rogers worked as an Army historian and member of a mortar squad. He was deployed during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Whenever the, uh, the animals uh, saw we got to get out of this place came on, that Volume went up to max, and we're all dancing around in the middle of the night, probably scaring the poor guys who were sleeping, or <laughs> trying to uh, get some rest before they flew to Japan. But yeah, that was our song. From 1970 to 1971, Bonnie Callan was an Air Force intensive care nurse at the Cameron Bay Air Base Hospital in Vietnam. There was a local television station, and they played the same banana rama song over and over and over again. From 2003 to 2004, Jamie Reinhardt worked as an Army combat medic in clinics outside of Mosul and Baghdad during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Fear of the unknown and the unexpected, sudden eruptions of violence, explosions, chaos, death, War is one of the most traumatic experiences a person can endure. Veterans of war often find their lives are changed forever. S and D search and destroy, right, that right. means nobody lives. Right. Nobody. I went on several of those. Uh, seen my friends drop beside me, and I still wonder why and I never did get hit. Sappers came onto the base and they have a huge dump of gasoline and different kinds of fuels. It was enormous and they, they blew it up. We had a vehicle coming up the side of the road and it disappeared in front of us. That's typically what precedes a, a big explosion. Some of the hazards of working the river in Vietnam, you never knew when you were going to be ambushed. North Vietnamese had a habit of floating debris with a mine underneath it, and they set on the bank remote control, so if it got close to your boat or your ship, they could set it off. 
I was in a Humvee and it was a medical unit and so we weren't a priority for having armored vehicles. We had flak jackets, but they weren't armored. And we were going through Missoula and we came under fire. I'm glad I was 25, 20, 25, 26 years old. Because at 19, I'd have cracked up. Yeah. I'd have cracked up. Because you killing at least seven days a week. It ain't right. It ain't normal. It ain't and good. That, that ain't good. It ain't that ain't good. good. I mean, I seen guys break down and start crying, man, because, you know, today we going in. You know, and you don't know if you're coming out. Many combat veterans are also haunted with guilt from the moral dilemmas they experience during war. But, you know, when you see these war torn countries, you just feel bad for them. Uh, little children cannot go to school. Uh, women and folks are living primitive. The day I left the country, the kids, boys and girls, were standing at the bus stops with backpacks waiting for the bus. Their town, their village behind them was on fire. Um, and they're still standing in, standing out there waiting for the bus. And that still breaks my heart. That's one of the things I can't get over, is that we went into Iraq in 90, mm -hmm. and we still bombing that country. Yeah. We're still murdering those people. We're still sending troops. Yeah. What sense does that even make? I remember when we crossed over the, the berm from Kuwait to Iraq, and there were kids out in the fields and whatnot, and they were begging for food and water. Intensive cares are about dying or getting people home, mended and put back together and, and, and home. So it was very intensive. We didn't have enough time to really know most of these guys because they were there just for a few hours before they got chipped off to Japan. And I was in a clinic, so we weren't allowed to touch the locals be for fear of cross-contamination of any um, blood-borne pathogens. One night, a uh, father was carrying his son and they both had substantial injuries. We couldn't help, we couldn't do anything for them. We had to send them away. Um, and that's hard to watch them walk into the desert knowing one or both of them could quite possibly die from their injuries and you can't do anything for them. How do you go back and make it right? Yeah. You can't. No. How do you really be at peace for being trained to take another person's life? I mean, I'm never gonna assuage that guilt. And how do soldiers cope with wartime stress and nightmarish memories? Robert and Mark discuss a military tradition that's not often talked about, substance abuse. But even over there, we were cooking liquor and, you know, I wasn't right. right. One thing the Army taught me, <laughs> talking about coping skills, was, was how, to, how to drink. And even by the end of my service, and I'm not real proud, but it's the truth, you know, we were smoking weed and that's and what, That was an everyday thing, and now, yeah. We stayed high 24-7. And it, it was legal. It, you know, nobody, <laughs> nobody talks about that. Really, nobody talks about that. They didn't bother you. The use of drugs and alcohol by servicemen in Vietnam was not terribly different from what had been experienced and seen in both World War I and World War II in the Korean War. What was different, of course, was the widespread prevalence of marijuana and drugs in Vietnam. Um, compared to other wars. The drug of choice in World War I, II, and Korea was largely alcohol. Um, alcohol created all sorts of morale, discipline issues. It took years for me to figure out that being drunk and high wasn't yeah, a nah. coping mechanism, but I didn't, I mean, what did I know? I was yeah, a kid. Yeah. In Knoxville, Tennessee, the Helen Ross McNabb Military Services Facility offers hope to veterans who are suffering from conditions associated with war or military culture. The counseling services are free for veterans and their families. The facility provides help even to those whose discharge papers label them as dishonorable. The prevalence or co-occurring of substance abuse and, and PTSD is, uh, 
it's pretty high. It's pretty pretty high percentage. And becomes the the number one thing that they have to stop. Even though symptoms may slow down for a little bit, they're still stuck in this um, cycle of of abuse. We do treat substance abuse issues, whether it's alcohol, drugs. We are an outpatient clinic, so we work to get the veterans through those difficult times back into society. These clinical therapists have served in the military during peacetime and during war. This unique branch of Helen Ross McNabb was created to fill a gap in military mental health services. There were 22 veterans or so committing suicide daily. The VA can't handle them all, but a lot of these guys falling through the cracks. The Department of Veterans Affairs estimates that nearly 30% of Vietnam veterans have suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. The VA also estimates that between 11 and 20% of veterans of recent conflicts also have PTSD. These statistics are based on reported cases only. Someone who has post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, their beliefs are considerably different now than they were prior to, prior to combat. The world now is an unpredictably dangerous place. PTSD, the doctor tells you, it's something you live with, not something you die from. But if you look at the suicide rate, it is something you die from. In 1966, James Cook volunteered for the Vietnam War. His first assignment was with Graves Registration, processing dead American soldiers. In 1968, James attempted suicide, receiving treatment at Walter Reed Army Hospital in Washington, D.C. His nephew, Daniel Cook Jr., served in the Army in Afghanistan on May 23, 2017, Daniel took his own life. He was 24 years old. It's multifaceted regarding the high suicide rate. A lot of our veterans feel stigmatized. Their beliefs about themselves tend to change to where they believe they're now incompetent, inadequate to deal with the daily stressors of life. Some veterans experience difficulties transitioning to civilian life. Some do find good jobs and they're able to succeed and flourish in the profession that they've chosen. Uh, but others have a very difficult time with that. I uh, have many vets and know of many vets who just jump from job to job to job because they're learning that they just can't deal with the pressures that's imposed upon them and expected uh, to perform and meet the obligations of their jobs. Many of them came back to a nation in recession so that there are diminished economic opportunities for them to return to. I think they have, as especially time wore on, uh, returned to a war-weary society. A lot of our troops trained for jobs that just don't translate or transition well into our society, into this culture. They're learning that they, they may be far behind those in their, their age group in education and uh, vocational training. So they, again, they feel kind of left out and left behind. Many veterans of recent conflicts are experiencing high rates of disability, amputations, and other traumatic injuries. I think some of the transitions have been made more difficult because of the increased technological capacity of warfare and how um, more people survive, but survive in context of severe physical damage so that their lives may be better protected, but their physical and mental well-being is not. I was uh, medically retired. Most of my uh, issues in health are uh, from most likely uh, being, having been exposed to chemicals in Iraq. Uh, I was medevaced out uh, from Iraq for uh, suspected colon cancer. Exposure to toxic chemicals is a hazard that is not often discussed by veterans or recognized by the government as a war-related injury. You go to a lot of the wounded warrior programs and they automatically, the first question is where, you, where were you shot and such, and then having to go into a story that you usually don't want to talk about, but it, end up having to talk about. 
I'd say the most bad experience that I had was being exposed to Agent Orange twice. Mm -hmm. We were anchored out for a short period of time, and the choppers come over and they're like crop dusters, and the stuff stinks to high heaven. And of course, at that time, they told us there was no health issues with Agent Orange. I hope nobody has to go through what I went through or what you went through in Iraq. It's a bad experience all the way around. Besides physical injuries, many veterans return home with psychological issues. Some military personnel feel that seeking mental health care could end their military careers. In a military population, there's that stigma because it also affects your job, you know, what you can do. And if, if the military is your career, and you're diagnosed with a, with a mental disorder that could um, discharge you from the military, your family's future is at is stake. And sometimes soldiers are intimidated when they seek mental health services while they're in the military. We had a mental health, um, the only mental health provider. Did you have a lot of um, uh, mental health cases? We had a psychiatrist to begin with, um, but he got depressed and refused to get out of bed. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so after that, we had a psychiatric PA who headed up our mental health. Um, and he was known for everyone is returned to duty. Um, and he had criteria, he would say, suicidal and they're saying they're sleepwalking well we can dis disprove that and um we can disprove just about anything i there were we had three mental health patients that were evacuated to germany we have to change our public perception we have to change that mindset chad rogers received mental health services from a veterans administration hospital they diagnosed me early uh, with anxiety and depression and PTSD. And I know I've got issues, but I don't know necessarily if it's the same what they say, but it is what it is. Having mental health issues or even a physical injury may cause a soldier to silently suffer because of toxic masculinity. I think that when we can just flippantly and insensitively say, just get over it, again, there's a just a huge lack of understanding into what's really happening in that person's life. For someone that's struggling with PTSD and they're being told to man up, if we see that as a, as a civilian or as, a, as another veteran, we should definitely discourage that because most likely the person that's saying that isn't trained to diagnose anything. Even female veterans can internalize toxic masculinity. The combat veteran that I had that, that was female had pretty much the same thought pattern as some of, some of the males, that she could tough it up, that, you know, hey, um, if, if I just keep on, I just don't say anything, it'll go away all by itself. I ended up with torn ACL, torn meniscus, and we didn't have the medical equipment to, um, to know that I had a torn ACL, and so I stayed in country. Be tough guys, you're supposed to be tough. Huh? Yep, suck it up, and and that's what you do. I was walking slower, but try not to limp because then you're you're already a woman, and people are looking down on you and your abilities. And then now she wants to get out of duty. If I feel like I'm suffering, I suck it up. And one thing the military will teach you is that things can always get worse. There's no time for the emotional side. Both generations of veterans have experienced a disconnect with civilians when they try to talk about their war experiences. The American citizen really doesn't understand the American soldier. As a result of them not understanding what we have been through, we catch hell trying to get our benefits. America is so insulated that the average citizen doesn't know war. For me, 
it's the smell of charred flesh. It's really that's that's yeah. what sticks with me. Sometimes yeah. when I eat, I mean, yeah, it's you just, can taste it. Yeah, I just can't. Yeah, I can't get rid don't of it. That. It wasn't until I met this fireman and something just clicked, and I could talk to him. Mm -hmm. And then I realized how much of an asshole I was being, and you know, I stopped drinking, or at least tried to stop drinking. I still try to stop drinking. Yeah, because it's you. not good for anybody. But yeah, uh, and then I started talking to other veterans. How long was it before you could start talking a little bit about anything? A good 30 years, I'd say, when I held a first reunion in Pigeon Forge. And then a bunch of the guys were sitting around the breakfast table one morning with their families. And one guy said, hey, do you remember when? And then that started the ball rolling. And we just kept talking about our experiences without even realizing we had the family there. During the Persian Gulf War, some American citizens began a support the troops campaign. Civilians also began thanking veterans for their service. Veterans have mixed responses to these expressions. And I don't know how you feel about it, but when somebody says, thank you for your service, I said, here I am almost 80 years old. And when I came home, nobody said thank you. So now they're pushing for the, the civilians to say thank you for your service. I accept it, but are they for real? I Are they for really for real? If you want to thank me for my service, <laughs> go stop those 22 vets from shooting themselves right. every day, every right. damn day. Go help Somebody a homeless help. vet. Yeah. I don't want your empty platitudes yet. Yeah. I don't want your yeah. thank yous difficult because women aren't recognized as having the same status. Um, and even when I go out with my significant other, everyone assumes he's a veteran. And he is he is a combat veteran, but no one, I'll, even if I say, hey, we met in Iraq, no one ever, they'll automatically turn to him and say, thank you for your service. And I'm not looking for a thank you, but I'm looking for, hey, I'm a veteran too. Don't assume because I look a certain way or because I'm female. In all the years since I, uh, since I served, I've had one person ask me what was it like there. It's like, it doesn't exist. We, we, don't, we don't exist. We don't exist. Um, I don't know what would ever change that or what it would take for society to recognize but I'm really surprised that you say that about your generation because I thought it had changed a lot. I feel like women are an afterthought. Like, oh yeah, they're women too. Charlie Stevens still had the war on his mind when he returned to Vietnam in 2007. I found my return to Vietnam, I was apprehensive at first, but once I got there with my oldest son, and we started touring the places, and I found out it hadn't changed in all those years. And then on the way back, when we left Vietnam airspace, I told my son, I feel like the weight of the world lifted off my shoulders, and I've left all the ghosts behind now. Charlie's visit to Vietnam brought him a sense of closure that many veterans never receive. For them, a sense of peace is still something they strive towards. Don't necessarily have peace yet because the you know the war's still on TV all the time, the same places, see the same streets. You know, I still think about the people that I knew over there. People say that over time that your memories fade. I disagree with that. Because my memories of Vietnam are just as clear as they happened yesterday. Those memories are a little more deeply ingrained. Yeah. After meeting with Robert at the gardens, which was really a, a moving experience in so many ways, but to personalize it like that, to personalize war, I mean, was really powerful and, and moving, and not necessarily in a good way. I think I was pretty fucked up for the rest of the day uh, after that. What advice do these veterans have for combat veterans returning home from war? Don't hold it in. Talk to a family member. Talk to somebody that understands you. If you hold it in, it'll eat you alive. 
My advice would be to engage others. Veterans need to engage others and others need to engage veterans. Not necessarily about their service, about anything. Get rid of that arrogance and actually talk and seek out, uh, don't depend on substances. There were some things that I had to do that I'm proud of because it saved others. I'm not proud of because I sacrificed a piece of my humanity. As painful as the stories are to me, that doesn't mean they shouldn't be told, and it doesn't mean they shouldn't be screamed loudly uh, from every rooftop. It's regaining humanity, right? Service members need to regain their humanity. That's what needs to happen.